This is the Yacht Phoenix. This is the Yacht Phoenix. This is WF-993. This is WF-9923. Calling Vosa Haiphong through Radio Haiphong ENP. Calling Vosa Haiphong through Radio Haiphong ENP. Come in, please. Over. The voyage of the Phoenix began here in Hiroshima on March 1st, 1967. Packed in the hold of the 50-foot catch was one ton of medical supplies for the victims of U.S. bombing in North Vietnam. Money for the supplies came exclusively from Americans, unlike earlier direct shipments which had been channeled through Canada and sent on by Canadian Quakers. The voyage had been planned by a Quaker Action Group of Philadelphia, not simply as another protest, but as a vigil, a manifestation of spiritual commitment in the midst of war. The captain and owner of the Phoenix is Earl Reynolds, 56. Born an American, he has not lived there since 1952. In 1958, he and his family sailed the Phoenix into the U.S. atomic bomb testing area in Bikini. In 1961 and 63, he sailed to Leningrad and Vladivostok to protest the Russian testing of nuclear weapons. As a research anthropologist, he spent five years testing the effects of radiation on the bomb victims of Hiroshima. Betty Boardman, 49, is the mother of six children and the wife of a professor at the University of Wisconsin. While at home, she spends most of her time working for the American Friends Service Committee, counseling young men of their rights as conscientious objectors under the U.S. draft law. Horace Champney is 61, is the oldest member of the crew, a psychologist by profession, a printer by trade. He has been involved in the peace movement for the past 30 years. He is a man who dedicates himself to the strategy and tactics of peace with the diligence of a general involved in all-out war. The voyage was his idea. Bob Eaton, 23, the youngest member of the crew, is from Philadelphia. He is the only member of the crew besides the captain with any sailing experience. He has refused to comply with the U.S. draft and did so by returning his draft card to Washington last October. He faces a possible prison term on his return to the United States. Ivan Masser is 42 from Concord, Massachusetts. He is a professional photographer and has been involved in the peace movement for the past four years. He served in the U.S. Navy and was decorated for service during World War II. He is a Unitarian. Phil Drath, 53 years old, comes from San Rafael, California. In 1966, he ran for the Democratic nomination for U.S. Congress in his district and was defeated running on a peace ticket. In 1965, he was one of a group of Quakers who went to Mississippi and helped to rebuild over 30 Negro churches that had been destroyed. These were the people that made up the crew of the Phoenix. In addition to these six, there was Bill Hike, my cameraman for the public eye, and myself. I am not a Quaker, not a pacifist, not even at all convinced that the voyage would bring peace in Vietnam any nearer. But even in an age of countless protests, the boldness and the idealism of the voyage of the Phoenix commanded my respect. I'm sitting on the Coast Guard dock in Hiroshima, and behind me is the yacht Phoenix. I've been asked to report briefly on the proposed journey of the yacht Phoenix to Haiphong, carrying a load of medical supplies. 
this uh, undertaking is sponsored by a Quaker Action Group of Philadelphia, and most of the crew aboard are Quakers. Here in Hiroshima, the, the physicians have assembled, chosen, and packaged $10,000 worth of medical supplies, which will be delivered to the Red Cross authorities of Hanoi. The many people who came to visit the boat and its crew members in Hiroshima underlined the irony of Japan's status in Asia, the world's only country committed to peace by its constitution, a constitution drawn up by a triumphant America at the close of World War II. On the day we sailed for Hong Kong, there were visitors who had come from as far away as 50 miles to wish the crew a safe voyage and to press upon us small gifts of medicine, such as a box of Band-Aids. The Orizorakai Society, a children's organization that is dedicated to peace, brought paper lays they had made themselves, and a North Vietnamese flag. During the final moments before departure, they chanted, No more Hiroshima. No more Nagasaki. No more Vietnam. We expect that our voyage from Hiroshima to uh, Hong Kong will take about two or three weeks. Uh, then we will be a few days in Hong Kong to uh, load more supplies and uh, take on a couple of additional crew members. And, and then we'll be another week or ten days perhaps uh, to Haiphong. Uh, it's, it's hard to predict how long it will take to get through Tonkin Gulf. There will not only be weather, but there will be uh, problems of uh, uh, going through a war zone. And we'll have, to, we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it, as we say in America. The voyage to Hong Kong took a total of 15 days. While the Phoenix sailed south and to the east of the Ryukyu Islands and then west through the Luzon Straits passing between the Philippines and Taiwan, Betty Boardman was also traveling, but by plane. Her destination was Cambodia. There she was to try and negotiate with the North Vietnamese to allow the Quakers safe passage into Haiphong. Up until this time, the North Vietnamese had, like the U.S. government, opposed the trip. Their reason being that they could not guarantee safe passage through the Tonkin Gulf. It was hoped that Betty would meet the Phoenix in Hong Kong with a favorable reply, at which time we would then sail to Haiphong, south of Hainan Island, part of mainland communist China, through the area of the Seventh Fleet, and north through the Tonkin Gulf to heavily mined Haiphong Harbor. Although the people of Japan had done everything possible to help the Phoenix and had expressed their good wishes for a successful voyage, the crew had no idea what the reaction would be in Hong Kong. We all knew that the U.S. Navy was using Hong Kong as a rest and recuperation port, and the crew speculated how American servicemen would react to our presence. I don't think the crew really had any idea what the Seventh Fleet looked like. But when we arrived in Hong Kong and found ourselves sailing past ship after ship, someone remarked, David and Goliath. And Goliath loomed large indeed. The Hong Kong authorities treated us exactly as they would any other visiting ship although the Quakers had anticipated some difficulties. Like so many other apprehensions they were to have, no difficulties arose. They checked our passports, had us clear customs, and then granted us shore leave. 
The major problem in Hong Kong was how the crew would deal with the American consulate's office. Would the consulate take some sort of action that would delay the voyage? No one was sure just what they would do, but they were sure that sooner or later there would have to be a confrontation. They were prepared for confrontations, as there would be many before this trip was over. But each one seemed a little more crucial than the last. We decided that we would try and make our stay in Hong Kong as brief as possible. So the first thing we did was to refurnish our ship's food store. Every available minute in Hong Kong was spent doing chores aboard the boat or tending to shore business, with most of the discussion centered on what strategy would be used with the Seventh Fleet, if indeed we got that far, or how to handle the situation with the U.S. consulate. This young man, Raymond Lamb, yeah. owned Caltex yeah. for me, yeah. because he could speak Chinese. Yeah. The man on the other end of the line said to him, yeah. thinking that he was the station manager, yeah. Don't sell the Phoenix. He says to him, is that boat named the Phoenix? And uh, Raymond Land said, yes, it is. And uh, the man on the other end of the line said, don't sell the Phoenix any fuel. The U.S. consulate has given us orders not to sell that boat anything. All right, then I think I will immediately call the Port Harbor Control and ask them if the U.S. consulate is operating Hong Kong Harbor, that the U.S. consulate, that would they refuse to sell us some fuel because the U.S. consulate told them not to. Let's go ahead with our meeting now, and uh, we'll take care of this in due, due course. All right. There are a number of special validations of passports which can be made, of course, at the discretion of the Secretary of State. But there's a provision for a special validation of passports in condition where the applicant establishes that his trip is justified by compelling humanitarian considerations. Then, if they do not give us this uh, clearance, then they do not consider that the relief of the victims of bombing uh, justify humanitarian activities. In other words, that the United States has re officially expressed its regret for the accidental bombing of civilians, but not to the extent that they are willing to permit other people independently and at their own expense to do anything about it. I, I would change the thrust of your thing a little to say, isn't this a weird state of affairs where to help suffering people is not in the interest of the United States? It's in the interest of the United States to have, to have burned people suffer because that's what you're saying if you refuse to, to allow us that thing. Yes. Rather than this is, you know, this is tied together. This is another paragraph, you see. Because they, legally they have no, we, we can't, we haven't got them in a box legally. Yes. Yeah, well, you see, this is the thing. I don't like the idea of sort of applying for the thing and then in the same press release saying, we know we're not going to get it and here's our, you know, here's our rebuttal. That just doesn't strike me as, as a right ordering of things. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I don't think we have to phrase it as a rebuttal, and I don't think we have to say that that uh, okay. we can put it in a different way. Yeah. We can say this yeah. is the reason why we are going. Okay. And we should think that it should, would certainly be in the interest of the United States. Yeah, put it positively. Uh, it is obviously such, a, such an activity must be in the best interest of the United States, but uh, it's, it seems to us in, in, inconceivable that the United States would consider that the relief of civilians accidentally injured in a war uh, was not in their best interest. Certainly, it's in the best interest of the United States. And that should, that should be obvious to everyone. It should be yes. Obvious, uh, even to President Johnson. Yeah. Betty? We all agree. Yeah, I agree. 
All right, then <clears throat> that takes care of that. Now, the next thing on the agenda is uh, Earl's report of his uh, morning's work. Uh, well, this won't be very long. Uh, I, uh, first thing, I went to the Harbor Control office. Yesterday, I had gone to the office, and I had given them some questions. Uh, for example, uh, is the light on the northeast, the 35-mile light on the northeast coast of Hainan Island operative? Are the two 20-mile lights which guard the entrance to Haiphong Harbor operative? And they wrote these questions down on the pad, the gentleman who was there, and some other questions. And he said, I'll have these answers for you tomorrow. Uh, today, when I went to the same desk, there was another gentleman there. And uh, I identified myself. He recognized me. And he picked up the pad. And obviously, nothing had been done. And he said, we can't answer these questions for you. And I, very pleasantly, but very positively, and I uh, asked him, is there anywhere that we can get an answer? And he said, he suggested we call the map office, the one that sells maps. A certain Captain Williams there, who unofficially might have some information, but he, as a government man or as a official, he wasn't in a position to give me any information about this. So I did call this Captain Williams, who was very cordial. And uh, his cordiality didn't uh, help very much as far as the information was concerned. His information was that the lights on Hainan Island are used for the convenience of Chinese vessels at the time when Chinese vessels are in the neighborhood. And therefore, they're on and off, depending on the circumstances. In any event, he said, if, he'd, if he were sailing down there, he wouldn't get close enough to see a light on Hainan Island. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a good piece of advice right there. The time had finally come for the Quakers to have to meet with the U.S. authorities in Hong Kong. On the fourth day in port, the crew was summoned to the consulate's office. It was one of the first times that the captain left the boat. As we were anchored away from the dock in the harbor any time that we had to leave the ship, it was necessary to travel either by sandpan or water taxi. I don't think that the consulate could have said anything that would have changed the crew's mind about the voyage. Dr. Reynolds, what's the reaction of the United States Consulate General in Hong Kong to your proposed mission to Haiphong and North Vietnam? Well, we've just returned from a meeting with Ambassador Rice and three members of his staff. And at that meeting, we presented to him a letter uh, telling of our intentions and giving certain details of our proposed voyage. Uh, Mr. Rice's attitude was most friendly and non-committal. He took cognizance of the uh, information which we had given him. We asked questions back and forth in order to clarify our positions, and uh, we shook hands and parted amicably. Are you going to face criminal charges for making the trip? Well, we have been told that uh, such criminal charges can be made. Whether we'll face them or not, of course, depends on whether the charges are actually made. Well, I assume any indication on that? Uh, in the sense that they gave us a, a letter uh, indicating those provisions of the law which cover this matter, I should say, yes, he did warn us of this. Did they tell you why they were not giving you a visa? I asked if there had been any change in the situation with regard to the refusal to give us a visa. His, his answer was there has been no change what in the situation. What was the specific reason you were not given a visa? We have never been given a reason for the refusal. Will the consulate notify the U.S. 7th Fleet not to interfere with you in your voyage to Haiphong? That I don't know. Uh, the, consul, uh, the consul said that he would notify the U.S. Fleet of the contents of this message, but that what they did, of course, uh, was beyond his jurisdiction. And you are planning to go ahead with your trip? Yes, of course. We'll leave at noon on the 22nd. Would you read your statement, please, uh, Dr. Reynolds? It's rather long. I can read it if you want to. Would you read the, the uh, first two paragraphs? All right. Speaking for the crew of the yacht Phoenix, we wish to report that we are aware of your concern for our safety as American citizens and for the best interests of the United States. Naturally, we share these concerns. At the same time, we are moved to carry out our present voyage of friendship and civilian medical relief to the bomb casualties of North Vietnam. We are motiva motivated by a religious sense of the oneness of mankind as brothers under God, by our conscientious opposition to the use of military force, 
and by our deep conviction that the continued pursuit of the American military operations in Vietnam is a tragic mistake which violates the best interests of both America and the world. Dr. Reynolds, do you have any fear that you may turn up as a blip on the U.S. 7th Fleet radar screen at night? Well, uh, it's certainly a, a possibility, I should imagine, that this could might, happen. What might happen? Yes, I, uh, I can imagine what might happen. Now, Rice said that they would notify the 7th Fleet. Did he imply by that that they would ask the 7th Fleet to give you a safe conduct? I, I reported to you as precisely as possible what happened. What he implied, of course, you'll have to decide for yourself. The American Quaker delegation got its final warning here at the American Consulate General before sailing to Haiphong with a catch load of medical supplies for North Vietnam. American Consul General Edward Rice issued the following statement after he'd seen the three-man Quaker delegation. The crew of the Phoenix, the statement says, has been informed their United States passports are not valid for travel to or through North Vietnam or Communist China unless specifically validated, and that penalties exist for use of their passports in violation of these regulations. Further, they have been informed it's unlawful for any U.S. national to engage in unlicensed transactions with North Vietnam, including the furnishing of any goods or services, and that it's also unlawful for a U.S. documented ship to sail to North Vietnam or to take on board cargo destined for North Vietnam. Additionally, the Phoenix crew were warned that their sail plan will take them into a hazardous area where they enter at their own responsibility and risk. The skipper of the Phoenix, Dr. Earl Reynolds, an anthropologist from Vicksburg, Mississippi, told reporters after the meeting that they would go ahead with their plan to sail to Haiphong. This is Wells Hangen, NBC News, Hong Kong. The world press that the Quakers had wanted to attract so badly showed up in full force on the day of our departure. It was just after the last reporter left the boat that someone commented to me, even if we don't make it, at least our story has been told. Uh, BBC. BBC. More than five minutes. Yeah. More than five minutes. BBC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I feel, think we feel more confident this morning than any time so far. I feel that everything is working for us and, and the way is opening and then success is in sight and, and I'm very happy about that. Even if even if we don't get there, I think the, the Objects of the voyage will be achieved. The uh, word will be carried over the world, and it will help arouse the conscience of the world to stop this war and to stop wars in general. At sea, the crew was split into two different watches with Betty, Phil, and Horace pulling four hours on and four hours off, alternating with Ivan and Bob Eaton. The meetings for prayer and discussion were thus not as long, but they were still held daily. Somehow the effectiveness of the Quaker meetings that had impressed me in Hiroshima and Hong Kong was lost at sea. They were still striving towards the same goal, but for some reason they were unable to see eye to eye or arrive at clear priorities. The fact that these were religious services and practical business meetings combined compounded the difficulties. I, th I think the activist Quakers are terribly intense. And I think they're, uh, they must be unbearable to outsiders. I, I really don't know how outsiders stand a group of them. I'm not used to to operate in a direct action project to people whose average age must have worked out to be about 47 or 49. Uh, it was a very old group to be undertaking such a project as this. It would have been more in line if, you know, I'd been the median age as opposed to the youngest here. 
uh, I think that, uh, and, and because of this, because of, I think, my involvement in peace activities, uh, recent peace activities, which aren't quite as conventional as a lot of Quakers and a lot of older people like to think them, think they should be, uh, I think that there were some, uh, took some readjustment for myself. I think I was sort of amazed with the ability of some of the crew members to um, to sort of move along a little and get out of some of their older ruts as I considered them. So I, I was very encouraged by the crew. Well, the difficulty is if you tell someone who doesn't know what a jib is, go down and get a jib, they say, I'd be happy, but where's the jib and what's the jib? <laughs> and so, obviously, uh, when you have a person that's inexperienced, you just have to help them uh, all the way through and tell them exactly what to do and, and, and how to do it. And this is the only way you can do it. But since there's a certain amount of, of uh, brawn that has to be used in hoisting things, it's very easy to put them on a rope and say, pull. So. <laughs> they're of use to you, even if they don't know anything about the sail. If the crew wasn't hoisting sails or pulling their time at the wheel or sleeping, there was always something that had to be done. When the weather got to be warmer, sometimes 80 or 90 degrees, people took deck baths or just poured a bucket of water over themselves in order to cool off. We had to wash down the deck sometimes twice a day to cool off the cabin below and to prevent the seams from cracking. Sometimes it seemed that no matter who was assigned to this job, Bob Eaton had beaten them to it. Yeah, I could become a conscientious objector and do two years alternative service, uh, I could go to Canada, a uh, perfectly honorable American tradition of dodging the draft by leaving your country. But these options are always available to you. The options available to the housewife just to ignore Vietnam uh, and get off hook that way. And I think that to the extent anyway that we as Americans dodge around issues and sidestep them and go over or under them. To the extent that we've done that, we're doing what we've condemned people in the past for doing. We're doing. It comes down basically, I think, to a question of what's the easiest. And I quite frankly can't accept an exemption from killing as long as other people go and do it for me, which is essentially, I think, the position a conscientious objector is in if he's, if he's sort of intellectually hard with himself. I can't accept that exemption and say, well, as long as the blood's not on my hands, you fellas go out and kill. And I also can't accept the proposition somehow that I'm going to become part of a system, U.S. conscription, which by a very objective definition is slavery. I think it's a degrading, dehumanizing system. And if any service that I'm going to give to my nation or fellow men, I should decide upon that. And then it's truly service. But it's not service. <laughs> When we speak of joining the services and doing your service, it's not service when there's a five-year penalty for not doing it. I consider this a totalitarian aspect of American society that I can't comply with. I would hope other people wouldn't. We're so concerned about totalitarianism abroad. Don't seem to consider that it's right at our own doorstep from time to time. And for Americans, historically, conscription has always been anti-American and totalitarian. And now it's a way of life. In 1958, in Honolulu, Hawaii, when I was trying to stop the testing of nuclear weapons, when I was saying that uh, radioactivity from nuclear weapons is a threat to human health, I was called a traitor over and over again. Now, the United States just yesterday complained because China and France are testing nuclear weapons. The United States itself is the, now calmly admits that the testing of nuclear weapons in the air it constitutes a threat to the health of humanity. Now, are the officials of the United States who make these statements, are they traitors? Nobody has called them, called Mr. Rusk a traitor for complaining about the testing of nuclear weapons by China and saying it's polluting the atmosphere. 
then if I'm a traitor, he's a traitor. One of the few times that the crew got together was during meals. Even taking into consideration the spiritual nature of the voyage, the food situation left much to be desired. Food soon became an obsession, not for the lack of it, but because of the lack of preparation. The food was uh, to my taste. Um, it's not the way I like to cook. I'm a fairly creative cook. Um, I like working with fresh ingredients and um, from scratch. Um, so I don't really enjoy using canned meat, which tastes like dog food to me. Being down in the cabin for any length of time was very difficult because uh, seasickness is most readily induced. Um, so I tended to do as little cooking as possible. Throughout the voyage to Haiphong, the only communication we had was through our ship's portable radio. For the most part, we listened for weather reports but occasionally we picked up some shortwave broadcasts, and the world we had left intruded, and more particularly, the world we were headed towards. A new graveyard at U.S. Aggressive. You are tuned to Radio Complaint. Now, this is Mr. and Mrs. George K. Wall, sending greetings to their son, John Wall, who is stationed in Vietnam. Hello, son. To all my love, I greet you. At this season, we commemorate the resurrection of our Savior. To him, we have the promise of eternal life. Hold fast to that belief. Our lives and our hopes are planned for the day of your return. We will be forever in debt to you and the men like you who fight for the cause of freedom and human dignity. May Christ be with you. Love that. About three days out of Hong Kong, the crew began to settle down to the routine of four hours on and four hours off. And some of the tensions began to ease up as people started to relax. During the watch, I was either steering, uh, I was steering about a quarter of the time on watch. And the rest of the time I was watching, and talking to whoever else was also watching or just sitting thinking. Yeah, I won't be here a hundred years from now, and so I can't get too concerned about when speculating on whether it will make a difference. It makes a difference to me now, and I can only answer this for myself as an individual and as an individual citizen in a democracy where one's obligation is to do what one feels is right and what will make one proud of one's country, which I'm not. I'm very much ashamed of my country right now for what they're doing in Vietnam. Whether it makes a difference a hundred years from now, I mean, as I say, I, I'm only concerned whether it will make a difference next year or next month. And I'm hoping we can make some difference in this trip by going now. On the fourth day out of Hong Kong, we were 40 miles into the Tonkin Gulf, the area most heavily patrolled by the 7th Fleet. If we were to be stopped, it would be here. And for a few moments that day, it looked as though we might be. First American planes approached, Morris Champion and myself were gathered in the center of the boat and meeting for worship. And I was sort of brought out of this very quickly. Uh, Bill Hike running forward saying, This is it. This is it. I didn't know what it was, but I figured I'd better look up and see what it was. And by that time, I think all the initial reactions were over and everybody was crowding forward to watch this plane swoop down on us. So I really know what initial reactions were. I think that uh, after the initial reactions, the, the crew and their relations with one another and so on, and what they showed anyway, uh, were very calm about it.
crew spent the rest of the day watching the horizon for any sign of the Seventh Fleet, now that they knew where we were. Would they stop us? It had been decided that we would ignore any request to halt, but we would submit under protest to a direct order. When nothing happened and we realized we were going to get to Haiphong, it suddenly occurred to each of us that we had never expected to get this far. The improbabilities that had brought each of us to this point indicated to the Quakers a stronger hand than man's. As for me, my faith rested on the captain's skill. From a navigation point of view, I think he did feel responsible, just as captain. I think from the point of view of the fact that the Seventh Fleet might have given us some trouble, the fact that we could have uh, actually, you know, by mistake, been, been hit by radar-controlled guns from either mainland China or from North Vietnam. Uh, I don't think that he, he felt a direct responsibility for that because he knew and he knew that the rest of the crew knew that this was one of the options open and that, and that we had accepted them all. Uh, I think, though, that the double burden was put on him, the fact that he had to be dead sure of his navigation to land 50 miles north or south of Haiphong on the coast would certainly, especially if we had done it in the fog, provoke a radar-directed gun to hit that unidentified object. After 27 days, 17 days of which had been spent at sea, the Phoenix finally was pulling into Haiphong Harbor. Our approach was not without incident. As bad weather had forced us to cover the last hundred miles by dead reckoning, we ended up about three degrees off course to the east of a proposed rendezvous with the North Vietnamese. And for a while, we weren't sure exactly where we were. As we sailed through the heavily mined channel that led the way to Haiphong and took our first look at North Vietnam, watching the fishing junks as they passed by, counting off the buoys as we passed them, the crew now wondered how we would be received by the North Vietnamese. We had a welcoming on our arrival here. There was a raid very near the city of Hanoi uh, as we, our boat came up the river to the city here at night. Uh, there were several planes involved, clearly. Uh, the flak went up and exploded. Uh, ground air missiles went up and exploded, and they tell us that they shot down one plane then. It was pretty late at night, and it had been a long day, and, and uh, we didn't know what would happen. We came ashore in the dark, and there on the dock, we were overwhelmed with a real red carpet welcome. Uh, there were about eight uh, beautifully dressed and, and uh, comely Vietnamese uh, girls with huge bouquets of flowers, one for each of us. And, uh, and they grasped our hands, and, and their faces beamed, and they looked into our eyes, and this was a real welcome. Uh, they were uh, uh, properly restrained with bewhiskered, salty men, but Betty Boardman, who was one of us, got a uh, full embrace and reciprocated it from, from, from these women, one after another. This was a, a terrifically warming thing, and then for the first time, we really knew that we'd been really welcomed and, and, and were in. We were in all right, but along with the greeting of the eight pretty Vietnamese girls, we were also greeted with an order that for security reasons, our cameras had to be locked up. With $15,000 worth of film equipment locked on board the ship, for some unknown reason, I was still left with a $30 still camera. This situation persisted for three days, at which time I was assigned a Vietnamese crew. As we walked the streets of Hanoi and watched the thousands of bicycles that filled the avenues and exchanged smiles and greetings with the people riding the streetcars, it was difficult visually to see the impact of the war that was being fought in the South, except for the absence of men of military age, or the individual bomb shelters that lined the streets and the little boys who saw to it that they were kept clean of rainwater. These are the ones that have not been evacuated to the country, and these are the children who grow up very rapidly in Vietnam. Personal contact seemed very important, and we often found ourselves walking hand in hand with our guides and interpreters, 
people who might very well have thought of us as their enemy. Posters fill the sides of buildings telling the people that they would have to do without because of the war. But people have long been indoctrinated to do without, and they accept readily the hardships as the price that they must pay in what they regard as their struggle for independence. Upon our arrival, it was decided that someone would stay with the boat at all times. Except for the two days he joined us, that someone turned out to be the captain. The crew went on to the capital city of Hanoi while he stayed on board to supervise the offloading of the medical supplies. I don't think our role is to go there and say you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that. Our role is to go there and say we are Americans but we are fellow human beings and you are Vietnamese but you are fellow human beings. We recognize your humanness and errors and we hope you will recognize our humanness and forgive us our errors. And as a gesture of our friendship and reconciliation, we have this small token gift to give to you, small in the national sense of the word. It is very little help to a nation, although it represents a considerable investment of our own. And this, it seems to me, the protest is, is not the important aspect uh, to be stressed. Our first official meeting with the Vietnamese was in Haiphong where the medical supplies were presented to the Red Cross Society. It was also our first opportunity to hear what the North Vietnamese felt about the American people. Their impression is that most American people are against the war and that uh, it's being imposed on us by a despotic government. And I think they're wrong about this. But they, they seem to think that uh, they distinguish very carefully between the government and the people. They, they like American people, but they don't, they don't like the American government. They, they feel um, apparently quite uh, close to us in ideology because they adopted part of our Declaration of Independence in, into theirs. Once the medical supplies were delivered, we visited two museums. One of them was called the War Museum where they displayed American planes allegedly shot down by rifle fire. This museum appeared to be designed for foreign visitors like ourselves, as I saw no Vietnamese during these tours. They had asked us, what do you want to see and where do you want to go? We gave them a list and we saw everything we requested. Uh, when we got to Phu Lee, um, which was about a mile from a bridge and a railroad junction, um, the road had been there was evidence of a lot of bombing on the road that had been patched. Uh, lots of uh, uh, crushed rock was around, waiting to be filled into holes and things. Uh, the town itself was uh, seemed to be completely demolished. There, I don't remember seeing. I remember seeing just one building that had a roof on it. Um, the rest were all just. Uh, it was a ghost town. It was like something. Um, Hollywood might build. And the more we see of what's going on here, the more we begin to recognize that the U.S. military has one intent, and that's somehow or other to frighten these people to the point where they will give in. And to those of us who know what it's like in America, to who know the tremendous size of America, the tremendous military potential, it frightens us. Because if by some chance those of us in America who are peace people can't stop this war and it continues to escalate, these people are going to be virtually destroyed. And it makes you sick to heart to see a beautiful, brave, intelligent, wonderful people on the verge of extinction by the American military. And in this village we were shown the bombs that were dropped by American uh, airplanes and one of the bombs that was dropped was called, I think, uh, a bomb canister unit. Uh, this means that 300 small bombs uh, explode from the major bomb when the major strikes. Then they spread out, and these 300 small ones have 300 pellets in them, which, upon explosion, 
uh, shoot out into all directions and uh, strike people. Now, it was obvious to us that these bombs were meant to kill people. And as we pass through a field of sweet potatoes at the co-op of Fusai, there were the graves of six children that had been bombed while they were in school last August. If foreign intervention would cease, the Vietnamese people would solve their own problems. They, and I, I, I believe sincerely they can't understand what you're afraid, why we're afraid of their particular political philosophy. They have no designs on America. All they want is for the Americans to go home and leave them alone. They have no designs on anybody. They just want to build their country up peacefully. And this is all they want as far as I can see. And they really literally don't understand why they are being bombed. But they are ready to die. I'm sure of this positive. They are ready to die, every one of them. There's no such thing as victory in North Vietnam. America can't possibly win any kind of a victory. All they can do is slaughter every Vietnamese from the age of six up. And even they better go down to five, because some of the five-year-olds are already learning how to grab an American, drunk American occupying soldier when he goes around the corner. And they play this in their children's games. So you'll you never me. finish this war. You'll never finish this war unless you commit a mass type of, of uh, genocide that makes Hitler look like a piker. Now, if America's prepared to do this, all right. But that's all they can do, and it's the only choice they got. Quit it or kill all the Vietnamese that exist. That's all they can do. Our meetings with the Vietnam Peace Committee in Hanoi had revealed the tremendous will to resist of the North Vietnamese in this war. The thought of any use of nuclear weapons by the United States didn't faze them. They told us that members of their organization had been to Hiroshima and that they had expected to see a demolished city, but instead had seen one that was new and beautiful, one that had been rebuilt from a holocaust. That was their attitude. If you destroy our cities, our villages, and our towns, then we will rebuild them. Perhaps this attitude was the answer to the question that had perplexed us most in Vietnam. The ability of a people to smile and remain cheerful while locked in a war against the nation that holds the power to obliterate them all. In Vietnam, it was easy to come to the illogical conclusion that these people were unbeatable. 4,000 years of experience in jungle wars pitted against a nation that had won all its wars quickly. The Western concept of war, which is to fight until someone quits, is pitted against the Eastern tradition, which is to fight until you are actually defeated.
After having visited a museum in Hanoi and seeing three rooms dedicated to the people throughout the world who were protesting the American presence in Vietnam, and learning that the name of Norman Morrison, a Quaker who had burned himself to death on the steps of the Pentagon, was a household word, I had little that our visit would also be used to bolster the hope of the people that peace protests would ultimately halt this war, with North Vietnam victorious. Each time we visited a village or a hospital, I wondered how they would make use of our actions there. We were told things that are uh, about government lines, the same way we get the government line from Washington. One of the, I think one of the, the things that was told to us repeatedly, and we repeatedly told them they were wrong, was the American people are behind us in our struggle, and it's only a small group of men in Washington who are supporting this war. Uh, and we made it perfectly clear to every group we talked to, from groups of people in villages who believe this to the government officials who told us this, that uh, the American people by and large support this war, war. I think we also made it clear that we felt that this support was not so much active support as probably the worst kind of support in this situation, the support of silence and apathy. The highest ranking official we spoke to was Nguyen Doi Tring, Deputy Vice Premier and Foreign Minister. After telling us that North and South Vietnam was one country, and explaining that China and North Vietnam were two separate countries that shared similar ideologies, he said, My friends, in your, uh, your organization in the United States, in Canada, and in other places, have launched a movement in support of the Vietnamese people to demand the U.S. administration to stop its aggression in Vietnam. We wish that the activity of your organization for justice will be crowned with success. I don't know whether I'm uh, right to say that this is your slogan too, yes. but uh, in our language uh, it, is, uh, it becomes a saying that people of all continents are friends. The North Vietnamese awareness of the protest movement in the United States convinced me that the protesters cannot claim neutrality in this war they could quite conceivably be a major factor in its outcome. This means that U.S. protesters, if they are to be honest, have to take a very serious view of their action. They are not protesting all wars, but this war, in this place, and they are helping their country lose it. For Quakers who have long opposed all war, it was not a new experience to be told that they were aiding the enemy. traveling companions, the enemy was still war itself, and its dehumanizing effect on both the victor and the vanquished. What they hoped was that at some level the North Vietnamese had gotten their deeper message, and that they had, by their voyage and by their presence, restored some degree of humanity to the face of the American enemy.